Um, so thank you everyone for your time today. My name is Rosie. I'm one of the Penn Fellows. Um, continuing on with our theme, we're going over hemonc emergencies. So um, the objectives of this lecture will be to go over pediatric oncologic emergencies, to discuss common complications due to chemo, and to discuss common complications due to bone marrow transplant. So um, just looking at this graph here, you can see that ALL is the most common um, pediatric cancer or uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Then it's followed by acute myelogenous leukemia. CML is more common in adults. And then you have non-Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's and Burkitt lymphoma. But ALL is by far the most common. Neuroblastoma is also the most common childhood solid tumor outside the central nervous system. Um, so that's also something that you can think about. It's coming from the neural crest cells. Usually it's in the adrenal medulla or the sympathetic chain. So you'll actually be posterior or peritoneal. Um, so those are um, the other common pediatric tumor that they talk about is Wilms tumor. So this is like a tumor of the kidney that usually is not symptomatic except for like a slowly distending abdomen. And this is the one where people will say like, oh, grandparents came and they noticed the kid's belly looked really huge and then they brought them to the ER um, because this is such a slow growing malignancy that usually parents don't even notice because it's happening so, so slowly for them. Great. So obviously with any emergency care, we think about our airway, breathing and circulation or ABCs. So thinking about with airway and breathing in particular, um, cancer can cause an obstruction of the airway. It can also cause an obstruction causing superior vena cava syndrome, and it can also cause a malignant pleural pericardial fusion, which will affect your airway and your breathing. Um, so um, when we think about our obstruction, typically they talk about the anterior, stinal, anterior mediastinal mass, which has the mnemonic of the terrible T's. You can see strider, tachypnea, and orthopnea. Um, can, tell me, can someone tell me what the terrible T's are? There are five of them. <coughs> what? Thymomas. Yeah, so thymus is one. Teratoma. Teratoma. Yep, that's another one. T-cell lymphoma or the terrible lymphoma. Yep, there's two more. Thyroid, yep, one more. Um, it is in your thorax, that's what the T stands for. It's a thoracic blink. Yeah, thoracic aorta. Great job, guys. Okay, perfect. Right, so this one in particular, we're talking about our terrible lymphoma, our teratoma and germ cell tumors. Um, so um, x-rays can diagnose 97% of these cases. So anytime you have a kid who comes in, you just happen to get lab work and the CBC is concerning for malignancy, you're going to go ahead and get a chest x-ray to make sure that they don't have an anterior menostinal mass that will cause an airway obstruction. Um, advanced Im imaging is really difficult because you have to lay these patients flat otherwise. So when you're getting these x-rays, usually you're getting them Portably, or if your patient looks well and doesn't look like they're having any sort of airway compromise, you could think about getting one with them laying supine, but the risk of them laying supine is then all of a sudden this anterior mitostinal mass will be compressing the airway, right? And so you run the risk of them basically um, becoming apneic and coding on you. Um, not only that, if you think about doing any sort of sedation, you always you also decrease their sympathetic response, which then also puts them at risk of decompensating. So these are patients that the moment you get this positive chest x-ray on, you're very, very cautious with. You are gonna call anesthesia, you're gonna call ENT just in case this person becomes um, an airway, uh, if, in case this patient has airway compromise, you wanna make sure that they know about this patient early on and may actually already be coming in if um, they need to do some sort of imaging or if they have to do some sort of biopsy. Most of these patients, when they go up to the PICU, will actually get like some sort of moderate sedation or maybe not even any sedation at all and just do a fine needle aspiration depending on what it is. So these patients, um, again, difficult and pending airway, do not lay them down. That's like the last thing you want them to do and do not intubate unless you have your whole crew with you. So the whole crew is the whole crew. These are really, really scary airways. Do not take them lightly. Okay, 
Um, perfect. So superior vena cava syndrome obviously is a mass that's kind of obstructing your superior vena cava. So you'll have edema. You can see like enhanced vascularization on your torso. You can have cyanotic appearance of the skin and you can have swelling too. So this is also an emergency simply because it also hints at some sort of airway obstruction. So this is definitely something to look for as well. Um, okay, and then here we have two things, one on the left, one on the right. Can someone tell me what the one on the left is trying to point towards? It is not the arrow. Don't look at the arrow. Um, on the left side, I will say, let's particularly look at the bases of the lung. Does it look like there's blunting? Yeah, what does that mean? Hyperinflation or fluid? Yeah, it means that there's probably fluid, right? Over here, you notice your lung tissue is right over here. You have something here in your margin. So that uh, will tell you that there's probably a pleural effusion, right? Or a more pleural effusion. What about this one? What do you guys see over there? A large heart. A large heart, right? What do you call that? Cardiomegaly, and then when we're talking about the reasons that these people can have airway or breathing compromise secondary to their oncologic condition, what did we talk about? A malignant pericardial effusion, right? Okay, perfect. So these are just demonstrating some of those things. Great. So um, the other thing that we think about when in terms of circulation is um, you can think about hyperviscosity. So you have so many blasts in your blood that all of a sudden your blood is becoming sluggish and can cause like a perfusion problem. Central line infection is associated with sepsis. So that obviously plays into circulation as well. Febrile neutropenia is the same. So um, here with hyperviscosity, you classically see it when people have a white count over 100,000, but it can actually be less and these patients can still be symptomatic. So that is to say, although the classic definition includes a white count of more than 100K, it should definitely be on, it is a clinical diagnosis as well as a laboratory diagnosis, more clinical diagnosis. So if you have someone with a high white count of like above 80 or 70 and they're having neurologic symptoms, then this is definitely someone that you are worried about hyperviscosity syndrome in. So usually they'll have some sort of neuro deficit, like a headache, seizure, altered mental status, um, vision changes is pretty classic. And then it's usually associated with mucosal bleeding as well, just because their um, platelets are low. Um, you can see this in up to 20% of pediatric leukemia patients and about 15% of patients with ALL will have hyperviscosity at diagnosis. So if you have a patient with um, who you're getting a white count on already, just absolutely have that high on your differential and make sure that they don't have any neurologic symptoms. So management is obviously thinning the blood. You're going to give IV hydration. You're going to give isotonic fluid just to help thin the blood a little bit. You can consider a partial exchange transfusion. So taking out some of their blood, replacing it with normal blood that doesn't have a lot of blasts in it. And then you can give platelets if their platelets are low and they're symptomatic, aka they have bleeding. Um, for hyperviscosity, you don't want to give red blood cells. That's just going to increase the viscosity of their blood. Um, and then you also want to provide prophylaxis for tumor lysis syndrome. So how many of y'all are familiar with tumor lysis syndrome? Can I have a raise of hands? Okay. So a fair amount of y'all. Um, great. Yeah. So tumor lysis syndrome, um, you're going to see in any cancer that has a high tumor burden. So ALL is one of the most common and one of the most common pediatric cancers. And then non-Hodgkin's lymphoma also. Um, so as you all know, it's a rapid uh, tumor cell death it means that you release a lot of electrolytes. And so you have not only uh, electrolyte der uh, derangements, but you also have hyperuricemia. Um, so it's usually based, it's a diagnosis based on lab values and clinical status. Um, it's going to happen within the first seven days of them starting to receive chemotherapy, but the highest risk is in that 12 to 72 hour period. So within the first day to three days of them getting admitted, getting chemo, um, this is going to be really high risk. Um, so the way of management is basically maintenance IV fluids, maintenance IV fluids, hydrate them, hydrate them, trying to get them to pee out all the electrolytes. You're going to give them D5 half 
um, half normal saline because they can have like a hyponatremia. So you're just basically trying to make sure that you're not increasing their sodium um, quickly. You're giving them bicarb to help with the acidosis. You're gonna give them all sorts of electrolyte support. And then you're gonna give respiracase and allopurinol to help with the hyperuricemia. Um, I did not spend all that much time on it simply because I felt like it was pretty common knowledge. Does anyone have questions about that one? Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so central line infections, as you all know, are pretty straightforward in our occupations because most of them will have some sort of central line. So obviously the most um, common bacteria that's going to be infecting a central line is your skin bacteria, your coag negative staph. Um, usually it's staph epi, but anything coag negative staph will um, be a risk for infecting your central line. Um, then we obviously have staph aureus. And then Enterococcus and E. coli are the two other more common organisms, but co like the Staph epi is the most, most common. Um, okay, so what antibiotic would you choose for a central line infection? Would you use cefepim for a central line infection? You have a kid who has a fever, it's like 39, but they otherwise look well appearing and they have a pick line. Um, you get their neutrophil count and you notice it's like in the 2000s. Do you still give cefepim or do you give something else? What antibiotic would cover a lot of these bacteria? Most of these bacteria. Yeah, would Vink cover E. coli? No. What's a common antibiotic that we even give our sickle cell patients that covers all of this? Yeah, ceftriaxone. So um, I think we talked about this during Omega Code like maybe two weeks ago, but ceftriaxone is your broad spectrum antibiotic for any pediatric patient. Unless they're less than 30 days old or 28 days old, you're worried about your neonatal sepsis, your antibiotics are gonna be different. But if they're older than 28 days, ceftriaxone is gonna be mostly what you're giving to children, unless you have a few specific, um, a few specific indications. Obviously, if you have an open fracture, you're giving something else. If you have a pneumonia, you give something else. But if you're not quite sure what you're treating, you're always going to give ceftriaxone. There's only one time where you're going to give a different antibiotic. Someone said cefepime. What do you give that for specifically when we're thinking about our hemoc patients? Febrile neutropenia, right? So. Um, What's the definition of neutropenia when we're thinking about febrile neutropenia? It's an absolute neutrophil count less than? I heard 1,500. Does anyone have lower? Does anyone have lower than 1,000? 500. So an ANC less than 500 means that you have what kind of neutropenia? The, cate the categories are mild, moderate, and severe. Okay, so less than 500 is severe neutropenia, right? So this is ceftriaxone, but ANC less than 500 counts as severe neutropenia, which is the neutropenia we care about. If your ANC is 1000 or 1500, that's mild or moderate, that doesn't matter to us. Really what it matters is if you have an ANC less than 500, all of a sudden you are at risk for pseudomonal infections. That's why you're giving cefepime instead of ceftriaxone, because cefepime is basically ceftriaxone plus pseudomonal coverage. So um, for any, for any neutropenic patient with an ANC of less than 500, so any patient with severe neutropenia, they're going to get cefepime. So most of the time you'll have these kids come in, they'll have a fever, they have a central line. You don't know whether they're neutropenic yet or not. Their chemo might've been three days ago. Um, you get the CBC, you get the antibiotics, you give them ceftriaxone. And then if the CBC comes back and you have an ANC less than 500, you give them cefepime on top of that. That's how it goes. You're not really waiting for the CBC to come back because that leads to a delay in delivery of your antibiotics, which is leads to poor outcomes. So usually what happens is unless they have like a really remote history of chemotherapy, um, you can sort of say, okay, you're most likely just going to need ceftriaxone. I'm going to send the CBC anyway, but um, most of these patients will get the ceftriaxone immediately. And then once their CBC comes back and they are found to have severe neutropenia, they'll get the cefepime. Okay. So what antibiotics should you choose? We talked about cefepime. There are other antibiotics I can use that um, it begins with an M. That's the one I'm thinking about in particular that also has good pseudomonal coverage as well as gram positives and gram negatives. Mirocanin, kind of, perfect, great job. That was Edwin? No, it wasn't Edwin, Never mind. Someone said Miro. Who said Miro? 
Good job, Jay. Yeah, so meropenem is definitely something you can think about. Um, Zosin is also something you can think about, although it might not have as good gram positive coverage, so you might need to add something else. Great. So um, are you guys all familiar with like ports versus picks versus Broviacs? Um, if you are, nod your head yes. If you aren't, I shake your head no. I see no. Okay, perfect. So this is what a great time to explain what the differences are. Um, so over here, this is a classic kit. This is like a, goes right into your, I think your brachial vessel here. The idea is it is a central line. Um, these are at high risk for infection, obviously. Um, but these are for kids who might only need it for like about a month or so. They need access maybe once a day or maybe once a week. Um, you can give IV antibiotics if it's a central line, but you think about infections with these also. Um, here on this side, you can see a brochiac. So you see the insertion site right over here, and then you can see it's um, attached to other lines. So this is something that goes directly into your interior vena cava and goes into your atrium. So this is just like a more central, secure line. So you actually have to place it, um, but it's sewn in so it doesn't get pulled out as easily. Usually this has to be placed by surgery. This can be placed by a nurse or it can be placed like by some procedures who <laughs> is trained to do it. Um, and then the last thing over here is a port. So this might not be as easily seen because it's a little blurry. But what happens is usually there's like a little um, reservoir that's like here on their chest. It needs to be accessed. So if you hear someone say I need to access the port, it's basically you take a needle, you put it into the hub, and then now you have central access. Um, these are for patients who might need um, something like once a month, once every few months. And so um, the benefit is because it's covered by the skin, for the most part, it's not accessed until it needs to be it's less risk for infection. But obviously, it's like hard stuff is in there and it's in there for a long time. So it's also at risk for infection within, with replacement. But after it's in place and if it hasn't um, been accessed, then you have lower risk of infection. So this is the one that is highest risk of infection. This one is a little bit better, but still has a higher risk of infection. This one is used more rarely, so it's lower risk of infection, but it's a pain to access because you have to like, put the needle in it. It's pretty painful because you have to go through the skin. Versus the other ones, obviously, there are factors that are on the hand side. Um, but obviously, I think these can also cause a central line infection. Does anyone have questions about this? Yes? I would just mention in an adult that, I, that I'm pretty sure has a central line infection, but in this neighborhood, because we see so much MRSA, sure. I would use Vanco. And then if you wanted to cover gram negatives, you could add on a cephalosporin or a Zosin or, or you know, or meropenem or even Astrionin, depending on what you're worried about. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I think it's different in, in the adults with central line because we see so much MRSA in them. Yeah, I think also, I mean, usually these kids have had central line infections before. This is definitely not going to be their first one. And so the benefit is you can look at their blood cultures, you can see what were positive before and what were the susceptibilities. Or even the patients themselves will be like, oh, yeah, I have ESBL that grows out of this line. You need to, you need to start your pen or something like that. So these patients will definitely have a history. Um, if it's their first one, then you can feel pretty comfortable with Cetrex and obviously looking at your antibiogram and seeing what's available. But if they're super sick or super ill appearing, you're absolutely going to go for more broad spectrum to do things with Cetrex and it's really appropriate. So. Um, great. Um, okay, so um, in any person who has a fever and a central line, whether they're um, neutropenic or severely neutropenic or not, you want to culture all the lumens. So um, when we look back at our lines here, you can see usually the pig has two. Um, the port usually only has one, where Brogan can have two or three. So um, when you're culturing these lines, you're going to get a culture from each lumen just to see which lumen it is that is infected. You're going to get a skin, um, basically a free blood culture from the, you're going to poke the patient in addition to what you're getting through the lumens because you want to see if this is like a bacteremia, if this is a central line infection. So um, basically what you'll do is just say like, is, is the, is bacteria only growing from the line or are they starting to, is the line starting to shoot bacteria, bacteria into the blood as well? And that just kind of lets you know how long you need to treat a patient for, right? A central line infection, I think is like one week, but if you're actually worried about bacteremia with a central line, it's two weeks of antibiotics. So that's really important to do. 
Um, and then you want to make sure you're antibiosing through a lumen, right? So you want, if you have a central line infection in your lumen, you want to make sure that you are giving antibiotics to the lumen that is infected. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Quick yes. Comment. Yeah. Um, the course of the nutrient is also really important to be aware of. Because if somebody comes with a, 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 an ANC of 550, but they're only like two days post chemotherapy. Yeah, absolutely. You know that they're going to nadir much yeah. later. Yeah. So where they are post chemotherapy is going to be an important part in terms of knowing their risk and involvement. In yeah. That's exactly right. Thank you so much, Dr. Schechter. That's actually at, at the very bottom of my take-home points. But yes, if you have a cancer patient coming in with fever, it's good to know when's the last time they got chemo, what chemo did they get, um, and then like their history of possible complications. Um, Dr. Willis, you had a comment. Uh, with the central line infections, how aggressive do you get with the source control in terms of getting that line out um, yeah. if, if they're very sick? Yeah. Um, I. <laughs> what a great question. Um, I have definitely had patients who had a central line infection, were fever, were septic, were not quite ap approaching hypotension, and infectious disease was like, you got to take it out, um, and hemonc was like, uh, we'll wait. Um, so I think it really depends, right? It's like, how old is your patient? How, line has the lo how long has the line been in there? How traumatic would it be? How... how readily available is your team to put in like another central line that you're giving for chemo. I remember like we had all the time, it's like you gave antibiotics, you took out the line for 24 hours and then 24 hours later, a pick nurse would put another pick in. And so it's like, it's not great. Um, I've seen people tolerate a lot. Um, and I think the other hard part too is like, sometimes these kids come in with these central line infections, they're already admitted inpatient. It's like, is this some sort of other sepsis due to their neutropenic state and they got something else or is this a central line infection? So um, you will hardly ever take it out in the emergency room. It is usually something that the oncologist, the surgeons, if it was surgery required or the pick nurse or whatever, it's like a joint decision amongst everyone, but you are highly unlikely to pull this line. Yeah. 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 Um, the other random complication that we didn't mention here also is you can definitely have um, issues with your central line access. So you can always still IO these patients if for some reason you can't push through any of the lumens, they're clogged or anything, like access is access. These are patients who obviously need antibiotics quickly. So if you cannot get it through like the central means they already have established, establish your own central means. Yes, Aditi. I have a comment. Yes. And so we don't get a lot of patients with cords particularly, yeah. but um, I view that we do get a lot of patients with cords because they have a We're supposed to. Yeah. It, it just takes a little bit, it's like one extra step, so just to be cautious. Um, 
Yes, Adam. I think what's also very interesting about the Central Alliance is the way that our team has before I did my residency get a big team on division. I know you had one mm -hmm. at UCSF yep. as well. Um, sometimes they will even prophylactically load the lumens with That's antibiotics. Right. Yeah. And they use what they call antibiotic blocks. Yeah. So they'll fill them with Jeff Maya said, they'll fill them with, with Banco is Banco. the other yes. Yeah. And it's like a CC of Banco, so it doesn't actually go into the patient's bloodstream, but it sits only in the lumen. And it's like a prophylactic thing that they do to try to salvage these central lines. And this is another reason why the hematologists don't always want to pull it right away, because they're saying, I have central access right now. This kid is likely to become super septic and be very, very sick. I don't want to lose my central access because I think there's an infection there. If there's an infection there, I can treat through the infection yeah. and still maintain access. Yeah. Um, and then uh, obtain your blood culture before you give the antibiotic. Um, and that is also because like if the bacteremia from your skin draw results after one dose of ceftriaxone, it's more likely to be like a central line infection than it is like a bacteremia. Um, but either way, like draw blood, um, draw blood culture, give antibiotics. Remember with an IO, you can also get a blood culture via an IO. So um, please get a blood culture. Um, okay, great. So um, in terms of, uh, Complications secondary to chemotherapy, obviously immunosuppression is the goal of chemotherapy, so that is a complication. Um, mucositis happens when they're severely neutropenic, so an ANC of less than 500, basically like the mucosal lining of everything, including your intestines and your mouth, start to break down. So these patients have incredible amounts of pain and are at higher risk of infection um, because of translocation. The other thing that they'll say is like if we're, uh, uh, onc patient never get a rectal temperature because you're worried that in the process of putting the probe in there you might accidentally cause like a little tear or something and cause them to have a translocation of bacteria that causes them to become septic. So um, to fly this we talked about um, basically uh, also is a mucositis of the intestines um, and causes like a lot of pain, nausea, and vomiting. There are specific uh, complications with specific types of chemotherapy. So I just wanted to talk about that really quickly. Vincristine is something that's pretty popular in ALL and it can cause peripheral neuropathy. So these people will often complain of like tingling or numbness in their fingers and toes, exactly what you would expect for your diabetic neuropathy, but it's in the setting of getting vincristine. Pegasparaginase is also something commonly given in ALL. It can cause um, Thrombosis, so also with central lines, you can have a thrombosis, you have a foreign material, so clots are common. That's something sometimes they need to get treatment for. Um, but the biggest thing about pegasparaginase too is that it can give them like raging pancreatitis. So just be aware if you have a patient who got this pegasparaginase, they're having epigastric pain, they're having nausea, vomiting. Pancreatitis is a known side effect of this. And then often if they have a really bad pancreatitis, they can no longer get this chemotherapy medication. Um, the other common one that um, is less known is methotrexate neurotoxicity. Has anyone heard of this one before? Not really. Yeah, so this is really interesting. Um, so uh, methotrexate in particular uh, in, for ALL or the acute lymphoblastic leukemia is actually given via the CSF. So you have these kids coming in all the time who are going to get a lumbar puncture and who are going to get methotrexate like intrathecally. Um, so the most common complication that these kids will have is aseptic meningitis. So they'll have like a really bad headache. They'll have like this neck stiffness, no fever, otherwise pretty well appearing. And when you get your CSF, you'll just notice signs of like some inflammation, but no bacteria, fungal or anything like that. So that's really, really common. And that's something to think about in your kids who came in for this intrathecal injection, maybe stayed for a few days as they were monitoring the methotrexate level, ended up discharging them and this kid comes back with neurological symptoms. Um, obviously, if they have a fever, it's something you're going to give them antibiotics for, but for the most part, these patients are like relatively well adhering but have a terrible headache. Um, they can also have transverse myelitis, so um, they can have just like difficulty in their motor and like moving and their sensations and their um, like all over their body, which is also pretty scary. And sometimes they can present an encephalopathy too. So I actually had one case in residency where this kid came in, he got the methotrexate, his level went down, he got sent home, and then he came back a few days later for altered mental status. Um, and 
uh, just like was not answering questions appropriately and had a lot of trouble moving. And so obviously this is an immunosuppressed patient. They're really worried about infection and especially CNS infection. Um, and what was also really interesting about this case was that um, although typically MRI won't show changes, this one actually did. So he had like bright white spot changes that looked concerning for like either infection or some sort of leukoencephalopathy or whatever. We got him antibiotics, he got treated, he got a whole workup. And then two days later, we got another MRI and it was completely back to normal. And this is just what happens with methotrexate toxicity. It's just like really, really, it's common enough where people see it. And I saw a case obviously, but it's not commonly talked about. So if you have a patient like this, just know like, um, you are absolutely going to work them up for everything else and just make sure you get everyone on board. But it is a common complication of getting intrathecal methotrexate. Cool. I just had a case just because it presented. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So my kid obviously just presented with an aphasia and he had like developmental delay and had to go even as a baseline. Um, but he will converse normally. You can have regular conversations with him, but he came in and just obviously like a blur factor, um, you know, nodding yes and no, but couldn't form any sort of words. And then for a few days was Totally back to normal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's really scary. It's really scary because you're just like, oh my God, do you have a fungus in your brain? Is that why this is happening? Um, but like having that history, like we talked about before, knowing when they last got chemo, knowing what chemo they received can sort of help you narrow down your differential and your clinical suspicion. Adam? Uh, because you keep mentioning fungus, the one thing that we didn't talk about sure. when we were talking about febrile neutropenia and yeah. central line infections, um, from your practice at UCSF, what was your cutoff for getting fungal cultures in the ER for yeah. getting fungal cultures on the floor? Yeah, so one of the more common organisms that they had mentioned was candida. Candida will come up on a normal blood culture. So um, your, your threshold for getting a fungal culture in the ER is pretty high. You're going to get your blood culture, you're going to treat them for the common things being common, and then they're going to be admitted. And it's going to be the inpatient team who's going to follow up on the blood culture if this patient um, is consistently sick despite antibiotics, they'll start thinking about the other things. But even the most common fungal infection will come up on your blood culture within 24 hours, if, if there's a lot of it, or within the next 48 hours. Is there any reason to like empirically draw them in the no. severely neutral No. no. Treat, treat the most common things first. Yep. And let's see yeah. Um, even then, pseudomonas is more common in terms of a microbiologic, microbiologic infection than fungus. Um, and it's really when you think about your patients who have been immunosuppressed for a long time inpatient where you start thinking about fungal infections. Yeah. Yeah. And there are better ways to monitor for a fungal infection than with a fungal culture. Um, okay. Overdose of methotrexate, you know, uh, the level got too high, they got too much. Yeah. As you can see, there is an antidote, folinic acid. Okay. Great. Yeah, I did not know that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, and I just saw there were levels being monitored, but for the most part, they were neurologically intact until this kid came back neurologically not intact. Um, so that sounds great. Great. So um, the last bit that I just wanted to cover was to quickly go over bone marrow transplants. So um, if you obviously have a bone cancer or you have something where your genes are not right and they want to fix your genes, then you're gonna need um, an allergenic transplant or a transplant coming from someone else. Sickle cell is actually a condition where they're starting to think about bone marrow transplant for, especially because the morbidity and the mortality is so high. But big surprise, the morbidity and mortality of bone marrow transplant is also not so hot. So um, it's kind of like a rock in a hard place deciding where you are and what you're comfortable with. Um, so the thing that um, I didn't mention before is like acute lymphoblastic leukemia or the most common pediatric cancer in pediatric patients um, has like a 95% survival rate and cure rate. So it's really, really good. Um, even then, if you are, if you're 
ALL is so recalcitrant to chemotherapy that you need a bone marrow transplant. The five-year survival for like a matched sibling transplant is 70%. So still not that bad for something that is like so horrible and awful and requires people to be in the hospital for such a long time. Um, so um, this is basically like a last ditch effort to try to cure these children of their leukemia. And it has a 70%, 70% five-year survival rate. So not terrible. And again, this is for a matched sibling donor transplant. So if you're like matched and unrelated versus like less matched and all that kind of stuff, obviously your outcomes are going to be worse. Um, so um, the other thing I was going to say is sometimes you'll get an autologous transplant. These are for the kids with like neuroblastoma um, or uh, sometimes they're even thinking about this for your um, for your sickle cell patients where Christina earlier was talking about gene therapy. You basically like take a little bit or take what take their normal bone marrow if they had normal bone marrow or um, this is like for your neuroblastoma patients, you obliterate them with cancer to try to get rid of the neuroblastoma and then you give them back their own stem cells to hope that they're going to be okay. So these are the two different types. The allogenic is probably the one that we are concerned more about because it has more complications. So that complication is graft versus host disease. So um, you has a high morbidity and mortality. Um, they're at risk for viral, bacterial, and fungal infections because these patients need to be immunosuppressed for them to keep their transplant, which puts them at risk of all of these infections. Um, so usually when we think about GVHG, there's like, it's divided into acute and chronic. Um, commonly you'll have skin manifestations, so some kind of rash, and then they'll have like hair or nail abnormalities. Their liver will commonly be involved. They'll have like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, um, basically these sort of like cutaneous and GI symptoms. Um, so the skin rash can look like this. It can be on the palms and soles. It can be on the skin. It can be in a variety of places. It's pretty nonspecific. What kind of points you towards graft versus host disease is they have sort of like these um, rejection symptoms of like low grade fever, malaise. Um, you have elevated liver enzymes that you have the skin rash. Um, that should be concerning. Um, okay. Uh, so even thinking about your bone marrow transplant patients, the majority of what they're, the majority of what you're going to be worried about is similar to that of like your normal oncologic patients. You just have to think about infection, 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 and then graft versus host disease. Okay, um, I have some take home points, and then I have three questions. So we are um, close to the end. So take home points. Oncologic emergencies include obstruction of the airway due to mass effect of tumor and sepsis. Their immunosuppression and their central venous catheters put them at risk of a variety of infections. These children should receive ceftriaxone and or vanc immediately unless their ANC is less than 500. If their ANC is less than 500, they should receive cefepime. So if your ANC is greater than 500 to less than 1500, we don't care. It's still ceftriaxone. Until your ANC is less than 500, nothing changes. Um, Great. Um, it says uh, chemotherapy can cause toxicity that can involve GI in the nervous system. Ask for their regimen and their last dose of chemo. Bone, transplant, bone marrow transplant patients with fever have a broad differential, including infection and sometimes graft versus host disease. And graft, graft versus host disease often presents with skin and GI involvement. Okay, question one. So a five-year-old boy comes in after noticing his gums have bled while brushing his teeth. He's been more fatigued over the last few weeks and on exam, they note splenomegaly. His chest x-ray shows a thoracic mass. What's the most likely diagnosis? Um, so I'm gonna let you guys read out and then I'll have like a show of hands. And I'm also monitoring the chat if anyone wants to type their responses into there. Okay, who thinks it's A? Okay, who thinks it's B? What about C? D, 
All right, everyone choose A. Yay, that's the correct answer. So yeah, um, ALL is the most common. AML is less common. Um, and so that makes it the less likely diagnosis per the board answers. Chronic myelogenous leukemia is um, more seen in adults. This is not chronic. This has only been going on for a few weeks, so it does not count as chronic. And then ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Um, remember, this is usually like after most likely they think it's some sort of viral infection, but you won't have spinal megaly. Usually these kids are really well appearing. They just have some sort of petechiae or ecchymosis or some gum bleeding. Um, you happen to get the labs because you're like, wow, he has a lot of bruising. That's kind of weird, but otherwise this, the kid looks great. And then you just see isolated thrombocytopenia. You should not have any involvement of your other lines. If you have involvement of your other lines, you should just like make sure it's not cancer. Um, but like, remember all of your cell lines have to be down except for your white count or including your white count. If only you see like a little bit of anemia with a little bit of a thrombocytopenia, you can feel reassured that you're not missing anything huge, hugely drastic, but just keep it, um, be careful when you're looking at like any cell line being down in your CBC. Um, great. This is a seven-year-old boy who received a bone marrow transplant. He has symptomatic anemia with a hemoglobin of 6.5. In addition to being leukoreduced, transfusion with which of the following types of PRBCs is most likely to reduce his transfusion associated graft versus host disease. Um, so who thinks it's A? Who thinks it's B? Great, who thinks it's C or D or E? Okay, um, can someone tell me why they think B versus E? Radiation kills bugs, washing them, like rinsing them doesn't kill anything. It washes off some things, but it's not gonna kill off anything that might be intracellular or- Yeah, when they're washing PRBCs, what are they washing them for? Sorry? I heard someone say something. Christina, do you know? No. Um, Sam, do you know? Yeah, so basically when they're washing these PRBCs, it's like there's antibodies floating in the blood, there might be cytokines. So the idea of washing it is just washing it away. Um, this is the wrong answer because um, it, can help per, it can help with fever associated with the transfusion, but it's not transfusion associated graft versus host disease. So um, that's like a different, entity, um, and so wash PRBCs do that. And then Adam is correct, the irradiated PRBCs basically help get rid of some of the host DNA. So then the idea is that you're not gonna get a graft versus host disease because there is no host to graft onto. So this is the correct answer. Um, this was also from EM coach and it was a 70 year old man, but I changed it to a seven year old boy to make it pediatric relevant. Um, great, um, perfect, okay. Um, last question. This is a 17 year old boy presenting to the ED with weakness. He has bilateral three plus tonsillar edema, no tonsillar exudate, anterior cervical lymphadenopathy. He has tender splenomegaly. And then he also has a white count of 3.5, a hemoglobin of 10.5, and platelets of 110. What is the most likely diagnosis? So just let you guys think about this clinical picture a little bit and also think about his uh, CBC and um, what. It might mean, look at the answers. Who thinks it's A? B, C, D. No one raised their hands except for very, very few of them. Um, let's try again. Who says A? Who says B? Okay, who says C? And then who says D? Okay. Um, David and Jay, can you tell me why you thought B? Uh, I would just guess that it's not A if he's not sexually active. Yep. And then I think that the CBC, initially I was thinking it's like a, he secretly has sickle cell and he's like aplastic or something. Yeah. So I don't think it's just strep pharyngitis without that CBC. Yeah. So then I think that acute myeloid leukemia would be yeah. more common than CLL for a 17 year old, but I don't really know. Yeah, that um, is great reasoning. And um, you are very 
close to the correct answer. Um, I, <laughs> um, the correct answer is D. And I just want to point out, because you had said it yourself, which is like, I don't think this is a simple strep pharyngitis I thought it was going to be until I saw the CBC. And I definitely agree. The CBC, like looking at it, you're like, wow, he kind of has a low white count. He kind of has a low hemoglobin. He kind of has low platelets. But if you think about when you have your kids coming in with their first presentation of a malignancy, their hemoglobin is not usually 10.5. What is it usually? Like yeah, like a six or a seven, right? And your platelets are not usually 110. They're like well below 50. The other thing is the hard part about this is it requires you to remember like what happens in leukemia. You're going to have a raging high white count because you're just producing a bunch of glass, especially in acute myeloid leukemia too. The myeloid is for the neutrophils. You're just like making a bunch of like crappy looking neutrophils that don't work. So um, that's the reason this answer is D, strep pharyngitis. It definitely was trying to lead you towards thinking cancer, especially because it was in the cancer subset. Um, but I think the point is just like when you're looking through these things, um, there are a few things that like the tonsillar, the tonsillar edema doesn't quite make sense. The cervical lymphadenopathy is kind of weird. Usually when you're thinking about like lip nodes, you're thinking uh, axillary inguinal, you think of your classical super cervical, Super, super cervical? No, super clavicular. Super Thank you guys. Yeah, um, and then uh, and then the other thing is like he has tender splenomegaly, right? If you have a malignancy, you'll have splenomegaly. It shouldn't be tender. Tender is going to point you towards something infectious. So um, that's why this answer is D. Um, the last thing I want to uh, remind you guys too is just your trisomy twenty one patients are at higher risk of. Um, malignancy too, especially ALL. Um, so that's something to think about also in these patients, in your uh, trisomy 21 patients, if, if they have symptoms of B symptoms, then you should think about it. Um, I think Dr. Schechter, you raised your hand. No, okay, never mind. Yes, Dr. Khan. Infection, the viral infections can give you viral suppression, right? You can have numbers that are skewed, you might count the number. One line can be low secondary to that, so you just want to kind of yeah. take it from marrow. Yeah. You just repeat it like two. Yeah. I also was gonna say too, especially in our in our population, you know, we tend to have people who have like uh, asymptomatic mild neutropenia, or sometimes you can have some sort of um, bone marrow suppression secondary to a virus, which could also cause your ITP. So um, just, again, being really careful when you look at the CBC and saying like, does this look like cell lines are down markedly or just mildly, um, like I should obviously think about malignancy, but is there something else that kind of points away from malignancy and, and feels more reassuring against malignancy? Can I help follow up? Yeah, yeah. So yes, Sam. I know it's a multiple choice question, but before I read the answer choices, I was kind of thinking mono. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, I don't know really. I 100% when I read this question and said streptococcus pharyngitis, I was like, oh, this sounds like mono, especially with the tender splenomegaly. Mm -hmm. um, like that's just to answer your differential. Yeah, exactly. There was just like, these were the answers. And so D was the least worst option. Um, but if it had said mo infectious mononucleosis pharyngitis, it would be um, a slam dunk with the tender splenomegaly and everything. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Or it could have been me, honestly. Like I, I saw them and then I typed them. So I might've, it could have been that. So I apologize. <laughs> What's up, Adam? I would like to be Googling because I see that strep does cause TTP. That if you have a strep infection, you can develop thrombocytopenic whatever the two, yeah, right? yeah, um, the thrombolytic purpura, yes, yeah, so that, thank you. The white count though confused me because I just don't know where the suppression of the white count is coming from. I think, okay, so the more we talk about this, the more I think it was supposed to be infectious mononucleosis pharyngitis. <laughs> 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 so that's that's my bad. <laughs> 